Welcome to the uh, launch of the Spring 2020 Edelman Barometer Trust Report with a particular focus on institutional trust in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Stephen Kehoe. I lead Edelman's operations in Asia Pacific. And I'm joined this morning, first and foremost, by Richard Edelman from New York. Richard, of course, needs no introduction. Richard's going to kick things off with a presentation of the findings um, of the report. And we will then move to a panel discussion, um, who I'm going to quickly introduce uh, to you uh, now. Very distinguished lineup of uh, commentators and speakers. Firstly, Kishore Mabubani, who is a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, the National Inst University of Singapore. Those of you who know Kishore know that he is a seasoned diplomat and a prolific thinker, author, and indeed commentator on global issues. We're so pleased to have him join us today. Secondly, we're joined by Professor Hong Fan, Director of the National Image Research Center and Professor at the School of Journalism and Communications at Tsinghua University um, in China. And thirdly, by Yoshito Hori, Chairman and CEO of Globus Group in Japan. He is the founder of Globus Management School and is one of Japan's most influential business people and indeed commentator on business. So welcome to everybody for joining the launch today. We're looking forward to a good dynamic discussion. Um, one housekeeping remark, those of you who are now familiar with Zoom will know that the best way to ask questions is to click on the chat function uh, below, uh, field your questions, and then when we get into the Q&A portion of the session, I will direct those uh, questions either to Richard um, or to uh, one of the panelists. So with those formalities out of the way, turn it over to you, Richard, uh, to introduce the findings of the report. Thank you very much, Stephen. So uh, you know that uh, we do this uh, report uh, every year for Davos uh, in January. Um, we were in the field in October. Uh, we reported out uh, in January that in fact, business had become the most trusted institution in the world, that there was a continuing tension between the mass population and the elites, uh, that uh, in fact, there was a continuing battle for truth, a big search for um, fact in a time of misinformation, uh, and that generally, the happier countries in the world uh, tended to be in Asia. Uh, it was China, India, Indonesia, and two in the Middle East. Um, and so that's how we came to um, this year 2020. Um, and over the 20 years of trust, what we have tended to find is that uh, more or less of the four institutions we follow, business, government, media and NGOs, that uh, in fact, NGOs were the most trusted historically, um, big rise in trust in Asia in the last decade. Media was a little bit like a uh, airplane running out of fuel going on like this, and then starting to nose down in particular because of lack of trust in social media. Government, very, very high trust in China, and then most recently in India, somewhat less so in uh, Korea and Japan and business, the most unpredictable one of the four, um, more or less in the last five years though, business has been on a quite straight line. So that by the time we came to Davos last year, business was the most trusted institution, even with places like China and India where government trust is very high, business was right there with them. So that's where we were. And let me tell you where we are today. So next slide. We are at a high point ever in trust in the Edelman Trust Barometer. We find that across business, government, media, and NGOs, we are seeing a very high score across each. The highest country in trust in the world is China, followed by India. You'll see, however, that uh, Korea is solid middle and Japan is way at the bottom. Not quite at Fukushima-like numbers, but probably only 10 points above that. So Japan is the outlier in our data around Asia. The other thing to note um, from this slide is to understand that the mass class divide between elites and mass opinion is now quite profound. It's now double digit in India, in places, Germany, in Canada. It's no longer just a US, UK and France problem. It's metastasized. Next slide. What we find though, is that which goes up very quickly tends to go down. So in 2016, for example, in China, 
we had a big jump in trust in business and more than half of it was given back the next year. So what goes up comes down. We actually think that we're in the midst of a trust bubble globally. That in fact, the COVID shock is so profound around economic consequence, but even more so health consequence, that people are jumping into whatever lifeboat they can find. And they're hoping that institutions deliver. But we believe by Christmas, we'll see a significant downturn in trust such that this increase will be long forgotten. Next. So where are we? We're at a moment in time when there are a lot of fears in the world. And the first fear is personal health. Note that neither business nor government is getting very good marks across the world in keeping me safe. Again, you'll see that Japan is deeply at the bottom in this number, 11 for government performance on getting medical supplies. And so th that's a real outlier. Um, and at the other end, um, on business performance, China is at the highest end again, Japan at the lowest. So you're gonna to start to hear this as a bit of a repetition of my speech. Next slide. There are big fears of job loss. Before this study, when we went to Davos, we were shocking the viewers by telling them that 80% of workers were going to work believing they were gonna lose their job to automation, globalization, immigration. The new fear is pandemic. And for good reason. In my country, in the US, 17% of people are now unemployed, up from 3% three months ago. That is a stunning turnaround. Hori San, as an economist, can tell you that's the fastest drop in the number of jobs, job less, that we've ever seen in the economy, even worse than 1929. Next slide. <clears throat> Fake news. It makes it impossible for people to actually believe that which they're reading. Again, Asia is a bit of an outlier in the sense that India and China are quite happy with uh, the trustworthy aspect of the information. But again, you'll see Korea and Japan closer towards the middle to the bottom on this. Two thirds of people are scared about fake news, compromising the integrity of the information that they see. Next slide. And now we have the mass class divide. It's more profound where I come from. In Chicago, for example, five times as many African-Americans have died from COVID as white people. That's not sustainable. Half, half of Hispanics in the US have either lost their jobs or had significant reductions in income because of reduced hours. It's a different situation between the wealthy and the poor. And people everywhere around the world are pointing out that those with less education, less money, and fewer resources are more significantly affected by pandemics because they can't just, you know, work from home. They're essential workers, they're garbage truck people, they're police, and they're getting sick. Next slide. So here's the big news of the evening. The trust landscape has been profoundly changed. The most trusted institution in the world for the first time in our study ever in the 20 years is government. Government has been a rocket ship up in terms of trust. It is now more trusted than NGOs, business, or the media. Just the opposite of what we told you just some weeks ago in Davos. Next slide. I do want you to see this slide just because it amuses me. Um, for those of you wondering why you think the United States is schizophrenic, it is. Um, we have Republicans and we have Democrats and they don't even talk to each other. And why? Well, take a look at the attitude towards the federal government, meaning Mr. Trump, by Democrats, only 40% trusted. Local government, 73%, Andrew Cuomo and other governors, whereas, for the Republicans, the federal government and the local government are pretty well even, even uh, in terms of trust. The gap is 33 points on trust between federal government and local government for Democrats, only six points among Republicans. 
also look at the media. The Republicans really dislike the media. The Democrats think it's the last retaining wall of belief in the United States. So it's like two different countries. You're welcome to visit us anytime as soon as COVID goes away. Next slide. Okay, of all the slides you should remember, this is the one you should, because it basically says, we believe government is gonna lead us in every aspect of pandemic response. Containing the disease, informing the public, providing economic relief, helping people cope mentally, and getting us back to normal. You should think, well, maybe the media's job is to inform us. No, it's the government. You should think maybe business's job is for economic relief. No, it's the government. You should think that helping people cope might be an NGO thing. Nope, it's the government. It's the government, folks. It's big mama government. Kishore, it reminds me of reading Hobbes. People are prepared to do almost anything because they actually believe in the power at the moment of government because they've done lockdowns, they've had really good performance by National Health Service, and it's a significant change because when we went to Davos, government was neither competent nor ethical. Now, suddenly, government to the rescue. Next slide. It actually is important that you see this slide because trust in traditional media has never been higher. People are reading, watching, and listening to traditional media more than ever before. They may not be advertising, but they are certainly listening and watching. The problem for media overall is social media, which is contaminated by fake news. And so overall scores for media are mediocre, but traditional media is flourishing. Next slide. There's a real desire for experts, doctors, scientists, national health officials. I'm shocked by the low score of the WHO. That score has gone down by 15 points in the last four weeks. At the bottom of the rank uh, on expert voices is uh, journalists. So it again, somewhat calls into question, um, particularly on media. Next, NGOs. NGOs have had a important role in delivering relief on the ground in Asia, in Africa in particular. Uh, now in the US, Feeding America is distributing meals every day to thousands of disadvantaged. Uh, I do want you to note how much higher NGO trust is in the developed world than it is in the, develop, in the developing. The developing world believes in NGOs. This is a big change, China. 10 or 15 years ago, NGOs were at 35 or 40% trust, now 86. This is a big change. Same in India, very high now. Again, not so high um, in developed. They're actually going backwards in developed countries. Next slide. The reason, there's a question mark around whether NGOs actually get things done. They're good at raising money, but they're not necessarily good at execution. They're a key to the last mile of getting things delivered. Next slide. Okay, so this is the money part of the presentation because I'm presuming that most of you work for business. It is our strong conviction that business actually has been riding behind the first biker, and in this case, it's government. And government's been breaking the wind and government's been making most of the decisions. That will not be true in the coming months because what we're gonna see is business is gonna have to take its bike and try to pass or at least go alongside government. It's the moment of reckoning for, for business. We're gonna see whether business is actually believing in stakeholder or whether that was simply just air cover. Next slide. So there are several warning signs for business. Business has basically kept its head down, done its work, try to reinvent the business model, get money from government, and try to keep as many people employed as possible. To be honest, that's been noted by the public. Two thirds of people say, we want CEOs to act, to lead, not just wait for government to put restrictions. But only 29% say that CEOs are doing an outstanding job in this pandemic. That's only half of what people regard as academics or national government leaders. In fact, 
government leaders for the first time are more believable and trustworthy than CEOs. So in short, CEOs are sinking a bit. Corey San should talk about this. Next slide. And business is not doing what it is supposed to do best, which is to be competent. Protect your essential employees. Ensure that you have products and services to fight COVID. And most important, have you considered a business model for the eventual recovery? Have you figured out a way to make money in a restaurant where you can only have half as many seats or where the middle seat of an aircraft has to be empty in coach? Or do you have to have health passports for hotels? Those are the sorts of things that business has to speak up about now before the actual date of recovery. We have to create a context in which people can understand. That's why it's so important. All you people on this call, go back to your office this morning or even virtual office and tell your bosses, you've got to communicate. We're failing the test. Next slide. And in particular, we're failing the test of being seen as being with integrity. We're not operating with integrity because we're not seen as putting people before profit. We're not helping small business. We're not giving them extended credit terms. We're not really seen as protecting employees' financial well being. We're failing the test. Next slide. To, to win trust, it's quite clear we've got to lead the fight against the pandemic with government, even collaborating with competitors, redefining the company's purpose, and switching production. If you make raincoats and they need masks, make masks. Next slide. The greatest trust gains have come from the industries that are on the front line, food, healthcare, retail, CPG. Note technology is absolutely flatlined. It's the first time in 20 years we've seen that tech has now been surpassed by other industries in terms of trust. And you'll see financial services as usual at the back end. Next slide. <clears throat> so as we think forward, Business has to partner with government. People want health authorities to make the decision about going back to work. And by three to one, they say, let's be conservative about going back to work. We basically don't want to rush. We don't want to have further outbreaks. We don't want to have to go back into our houses once we've gone back to a normal life. Slowly, slowly do this properly. Next. People want health and safety over economics. It shouldn't be a choice, but in fact, the priority should be two to one, save lives as opposed to restart the economy. We've got to find a way to put these two together, but safety first, then the economy can work. Next slide. And government has big expectations to do it better next time as well. Get more medical supplies, increased health spending, health screenings for anyone to enter the country as Singapore is implemented and also restriction immigration uh, and international travel. Again, the Singapore model. So government has bigs to do's as well. Next slide. So we provide this graph for you as a mental construct. On the X axis is competence, on the Y axis is ethical behavior. We believe in the last 12 weeks, that government has moved from the bottom left corner just about to the center, improving both capability and integrity. Business has gone backward. Business has lost its edge in terms of competence and not improved on integrity. Media and NGOs pretty much the same. So here we are. We actually have a lot of work to do. Next slide. So I will conclude with reiterating my deep conviction that this is the moment of reckoning for business. Are we going to be a stakeholder or a shareholder model? Are we going to contribute to the end of COVID and be seen in the long run as an institution that cares about people more than profits? Everyone understands the stress of the business model. What they want you to do though, is partner and not just do. They want you to tell them what to do. They want you to talk to them and they want you to feel as if you care. 
empathy matters deeply at the moment. So we need tangible actions to preserve trust. And those are by both government and business. We need collaboration on solutions. A good example is fast tracking of the drug remdesivir for Gilead by several governments to get that into the hands of patients and doctors. Third, business has to live up to its multi-stakeholder commitment. Fourth, we need public leadership by CEOs. You've got to get your bosses to speak up, speak out, and tell how you're gonna operate differently. We have thought this through. You've got to show change. And the last is the return for work is an incredible moment of opportunity that we cannot miss. It is our time for business to come from behind of, of government, not be so protected, and go and lead now again. Thank you very much, Stephen, over to you, sir. Richard, thank you very much. If I could ask um, my panelists to now take themselves off mute, um, and I'm gonna go straight to um, Kishore Mahbubani. Um, the data seems to suggest that governments are the big winners, if you can call them that, in terms of the trust stakes. Do you think that's a bubble? What do you think governments need to do in terms of maintaining the trust of population groups across Asia in particular? What is it about the data that surprises or doesn't surprise you in terms of the things that you're seeing? Well, this is definitely not a trust bubble. It reflects a very fundamental shift in history that is taking place here. And one statistic which everyone should pay attention to is that the gap in the number of deaths per 100,000 between East Asia and Europe and America is enormous. In East Asia, it's like Korea 0.5, Japan 0.5, Singapore 0.2, China 0.3. In Belgium, it's 50. Spain is 40. US is 30. So that's a big gap. And that shows there has been what I call the transfer of competence in some ways to East Asian governments who have learned so much from the West over the last 100, 150 years, starting with the Meiji Restoration, by the way, in 1860. So the East Asian states have learned so much from the West, have, the governments have adapted, modernized, created, for example, wonderful medical facilities, Whereas I would say Western governments have sort of assumed that they have arrived and haven't changed and haven't adapted. So this is, we are a very peculiar moment of history where with power shifting from West to East, as you know. And, and, and as part of this process, the level of competence of governments in East Asia is rising, which also explains the rising level of confidence in East Asian governments. And of course, by contrast, because of the, the competence of the many of the Western governments, has not been great in this crisis, the trust in them has gone down. So we should not see this, we should not see these figures in isolation. We should see this as part of a massive historical shift that is taking place. And Kishore, if I can press you on this point around East Asian governments sort of learning from the past moving forward, what about the nature of collaboration uh, between governments in East Asia? Um, do you think that that is having an impact uh, for, for better or for otherwise in terms of the current situation of the pandemic, and are they learning about how to collaborate more with other stakeholders and bring them into discussions? Well, it's a, a, in terms of collaborating with each other, I would say to be very candid, uh, the, the, the record hasn't been great. But what is more important is that they haven't tried to undermine each other or compete with each other. And they've actually tried to cooperate rather than, you know, compete or undermine or cut off supplies and so on and so forth. So I mean, I'll give you a simple example. Singapore is the most densely populated country in the world. Uh, we, we, we cannot grow our own food, obviously. So we depend for our food security on our neighbors. And we never had to fear about our food being cut off uh, at this point in time, which is a very good uh, indicator. But in terms of collaboration with other sectors, I would say in general, it is improving. Mm. That mm. I think the businesses, especially in this region, realize that mm -hmm. when it comes to a major crisis like this, the government has to take the lead. And of course, they have to take a short-term pain, short-term cut. Of course, to be, to, be, to be fair, Singapore has been remarkably generous, I must say, in, in, in supporting businesses and supporting people. That's because we have the resources to do so. But I think other countries, uh, also doing their bit. So overall, I mean, the COVID-19 struggle isn't over, by the way. Let's mm. not think it's over. 
But while we are still in the middle of this fight, I think what the East Asian countries have demonstrated is that they have a certain degree of resilience that people didn't expect to see in this region. Yeah. Uh, Hong Fan, let's, let's turn to China at the other end of uh, the, the continent and, and talk for a moment about, there's so much we could talk about in China, right? Um, the first in, maybe the first coming out, we're looking at recovery. As, as you, Hong Fan, look at um, uh, people going back to work um, and you reflect back on the, um, the lessons, the circumstances which China could in fact be bringing to the West, how would you, how would you observe and reflect on the China experience uh, coming coming through uh, to where you can maybe see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Stephen. Um, in in the Chinese situation, um, people now back to work. Um, and, uh, we enjoy a daily, um, daily lifestyle, and we go to restaurants and uh, meet people. Uh, last week is our May break, so we have five days holiday and uh, people can go to visit tourist attractions and uh, family get together, go out for business. So things back to normal right now. Um, but I think uh, looking back, uh, I think I went to Edelman in Beijing uh, on the 7th of March. That time, two months ago, we started to work again. But by that time, people kept longer distance, social distance, wear masks, and uh, um, companies take, uh, have some rules. People take turns to go to work in March. So two months after March, now the situation has uh, completely changed. So after this... Uh, Professor Fan, I think we're having some difficulty um, with the connection with you. You're, you're coming in now to quite a bit. So let me go straight to um, um, Hori-san, if I can. Let's, let's talk about Japan for a second. I mean, you know, the, the data tells a grim story about right. the decline in trust um, in government in Japan. Um, how, how would, uh, reflect on that for us for a couple of minutes. What are you seeing? Okay, Japan is the outlier in this trust barometer. We have to prove the world that Japan is fine. Therefore, we have done little in tackling the COVID situation. Second week is that because of the constitution, Japan cannot enforce lockdown. We cannot enforce people to stay at home. We cannot enforce shops to close down. We cannot enforce factories to close. And therefore, we have never had any kind of official lockdown. We have declared, Prime Minister declared the uh, national emergency. However, we didn't have any kind of power to enforce people and there's no penalty. And therefore, we have not, never done, we have been slow and also we are weak in tackling the situation. However, if you look at the situation of Japan, as you know, Kishore mentioned, we are below South Korea in terms of death per million. So we have to tell to people that we are doing fine in terms of managing. However, the government has made mistakes in tackling in terms of mismanagement of the communication. You know, Abenomics you know, is an economic world, but Abenomasks, you know, Prime Minister Abe decided to give two masks per household and at the same time, you know, Prime Minister Abe was sporadic in changing the position in payout, 300,000 yen per household for those who have been severely affected to 100,000 yen for everybody. And so in case of me, I have five sons, I get 700,000 yen you know, without, I'm not losing any kind of salary, however, they paid out to everybody. And so this sporadic change, mismanagement, slow and weak, has made Japan to be the lowest in terms of trust. That's how it happens. However, the situation is not bad. And, and, you know, when we were talking um, sort of earlier today, we, you know, we were sort of speculating on what we thought this sort of meant. So, so low trust in Japan because of its inability to be able to act um, almost draconianly. Uh, when, we, when we look to a China and India, much bigger markets where the government acted more swiftly, what do you think this is telling us about the kind of government that um people need in the middle of a crisis and 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 where we are today are you seeing a correlation between the two well you know people are so fearful after reading and watching the media and they were so fearful and panic and they want to have a strong government as can be seen in the data however japan is weak in terms of the, the power that they have therefore japanese government was seen as weak and if you look at what the government has done there are two, you know, despite two things that we have to watch out. One is either lockdown 
or the self-restraint. Japan is a self-restraint, and the India and China is a strong lockdown. It's a very different. Second is a, what we call digital dictatorship. It's more surveillance. China is more surveillance. Japan is more freedom and privacy and also individual human rights. It's totally a different model. And however, the trust shows that Japan is uh, weaker. However, we feel happier this way. So the trust to the government may be low, but the situation is, is under control. However, the perception outside, maybe because of Diamond Princess, the cruise ship, the perception may be outside is strong, but we don't see any kind of demonstration. We don't see any kind of riots, no people are happy. And that's where we are in Japan. So we're happy about where the government is, and nobody is talking about the constitutional change, even though you know, the constitution is limiting the government's power. But we see Japanese government, you know, Japanese people being happy as they yeah. have the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And Professor Fan, let's come back to you for a second, because we lost you in the middle of talking about China. Okay. You know, the data suggests that, that even though the Chinese are returning to work, the fears that they have around long term job losses, about even more perhaps automation coming in as a result of the pandemic and shifts in employment practices are just as high, if not more, in China than elsewhere. So when the, when the Chinese are sort of thinking about, um, you know, how to allay those concerns, and they look at the confidence of the future, are they turning to business? Are they turning to government? Like, what, are the, what, are the, what is the, uh, the, the heavier influence right now on the Chinese from your perspective? And what does that mean, I suppose, for leaders communicating in China right now? No, I, I think uh, in, in China, the trend is like in the, uh, elsewhere, you know, in, elsewhere in the world, uh, the, the people will lose jobs for this um, epidemic. But the Chinese society is organized, is very structured and organized uh, by the government. So um, I think uh, the big businesses like uh, state-owned companies and uh, private-owned companies, if their size is huge, I don't think uh, there are much change in that. Mm -hmm. Only essential businesses, small businesses, uh, because people tend to go out to eat less or people tend to go out enjoy themselves less within the short period of time. So that might be uh, something difficult for the employees of small businesses, but the things can be changed because many people do business online in China. So if they use Douyin and they use new format um, doing business. So I, I think the development just like um, uh, new media uh, as a tool to help individuals to do business will be booming in China. So um, some of my friends, they, they, they are very uh, kind of low level in income. So they, they do business, they earn money um, from uh, new media. So I think that the change will be huge by using new technology to help people to, to maintain their jobs at home. And uh, also the government, um, at the last month, the, they have a national strategy to develop e-commerce as a national strategy just uh, nearly the end of the um, pandemic period. So I, I think that in a short time, some people will be very much affected, but in a long run, maybe in a quite recent time, mm. uh, the job opportunity will be back to them, but in different ways. I mean, let's hope so. We are watching China with great interest. Uh, Kishore Mabubani, let's come back to you to talk a little bit about the bigger sort of macro picture. You know, one of the things that, you know, obviously we've been keeping an eye on in terms of China is the US-China relationship sort of over time. And, and you know, there have been certainly all, all sorts of continued attempts uh, by the US government to, to place blame at China's door. Do you think this is, what is this going to do, do you think, for um, the, you know, relationship? Is it too early to say? Is this a, is this a, it's just just a spat right now, right? What what as you look as you look at geopolitical sort of shifts and around this, you see big changes. Well, I think you know uh, logically, what we should have been seeing today is that since COVID nineteen is an enemy of the United States, COVID nineteen is an enemy of China. They should have both come together to fight a common enemy. Instead. And this, this is for future historians to be very surprised by this. They chose to step up their geopolitical 
at precisely the moment when they should be cooperating with each other. This may be a surprise, but you know, I said, as I've just written a book called Has China Won, pointing out that this US-China geopolitical contest is driven by very deep structural forces, okay? And there are at least three major structural forces. Let me just quickly mention them. One, one is, of course, the 2,000-year law geopolitics that whenever the world's number one emerging power is about to overtake the world's number one power, tension rises. You see that happening within US and China. Then secondly, this is the first time in 200 years that a non-Western power may become number one. And that creates deep disquiet. And if I say somewhat delicately in my book, there's a fear of yellow peril that is emerging in all the descriptions of uh, mm. China. And the third, of course, complicating factor is that if China is a United States, the democracy believes in a very deep ideological fashion that if a society is run by a communist party, there's something fundamentally wrong ideologically. So that you can see that there's struggle forces that are driving the US towards a collision, which I talk about in my book, but I also emphasize, and this is a critical message, and in my book, I say the US and China can live and work with each other if both US and China decide that the number one priority of the US government should be to take care of the well-being of the American people, the number one priority of the Chinese government should be to take care of the well-being of the 1.4 billion Chinese people, then they can work together. In the case of the United States, the tragedy is that the United States is the only major developed country where the average income of the bottom 50, 50% has gone down over a 30 year period. Mm. So instead of focusing its energy on this geopolitical contest with China, America should listen to the advice that George Cannon gave when the Cold War started with the Soviet Union. Let's focus on our domestic spiritual vitality because at the end of the day, that's how we will win the contest. So I believe that if the United States focuses on its domestic spiritual vitality and China does the same, then it is conceivable, and this is what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to persuade both of them, please stop your contest and work together. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, 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 let's, and let's talk a little bit about now sort of leadership in the context of uh, COVID and trust, because, you know, as, as Richard presented in the research, uh, we're seeing these sort of big changes in the credibility of various leaders out there. And obviously there's been a, you know, an increase in government, but um, uh, Horisan, we're seeing a real decline um, in the credibility right now of CEOs and their ability to sort of step up as a, you know, as a businessman, somebody uh, deeply engaged in looking at sort of management trends. What are your observations from Japan or otherwise about um, the, the changing dynamic of CEO leadership in the context of COVID? What are you seeing in Japan? Um, what are you seeing elsewhere? And what are your sort of thoughts on what business needs to do to step up at this time? Very good point. You know, the public is now listening to the government. You know, Prime Minister made a speech last night. There were lots of people watching. And the airtime is now absorbed by the government officials and the Prime Minister and leaders. And the business, government leaders have to show they are the strong leaders. And therefore, lots of attention are now being focused on to the, the Prime Ministers and Presidents. Therefore, the business people have to make more efforts to communicate. In, the, in times of crisis, being quiet means you are not doing anything at all. So you have to speak up, as Richard mentioned, you have to speak up using social media, using YouTube, and also you have to talk to the stakeholder, and also you have to talk to the customers, to sh and you have to talk to the employees that we are fine, everything is under control, we will protect you, and that kind of communication is number one needed. So number one, what is needed is the communication. Second, we have to produce you know, whatever is needed and lacking in, in Japan or in the US or in China. Toyota is now producing ventilators and Sharp is now producing masks. And they are really appreciated by the Japanese people. And the Sharp people, you know, the CEO of Sharp said that the best selling product ever was the masks <laughs> that they produced. And so the second thing that the CEOs have to do is that they have to show that we care for the people. Third thing that you know, CEOs have to show to the people is that we are under control we can survive, we can prosper by shifting their products into more online and digital. And they have to show that, you know, we are caring people that you can do more of remote works and uh, uh, you know, we can continue even though we have COVID shocks. 
And that's what the CEO, the CEOs have to do a lot more in, in times of crisis and you have to be visible. Thank you. And, and Richard, maybe we could bring you back in here just to talk a little bit about some of the things you're observing from, you know, maybe our clients that, that and how, you know, they are responding within this crisis. Um, Hori San talking about companies that are adapting their production services to meet the, the needs of communities. I think we're seeing some of the same things from some of our clients um, in that. And what, it, what, it, what lessons are you drawing, Richard, for, um, for, for brands uh, communicating during this time and changing behaviors? So I think that the first phase was work from home, protect our employees. The second phase was try to get some product into the hands of uh, people who needed it. The third phase is shifts in business model. Now the fourth phase is this return to normal. I think these are four phases of business. And if I have to predict, I think there's gonna be a fifth phase now. Um, which is, in fact, reimagining business. You know, you're, you're going to have to have products that are lower price, smaller packages for people who are unemployed and disadvantaged. You're going to need to make certain accommodations. As a landlord, for example, you can't charge a fixed rent anymore, maybe. It has to be more variable. So you're going to start to see a phase five where it's, you know, business for good, but it's business to stay in business is the point. Um, mm. But, but I do believe that business needs to fill the void now. I think business needs to stop riding behind government and needs to go and act and stop being so afraid. And CEOs have got to explain how they're gonna go back to work in a new normal, not just the way it was. And Professor Fan, building on that, in China itself, you spend a lot of time counseling, talking to senior executives and companies about communications, how to communicate and all of this. What are you? What are you? What are you saying to um, your students, if you like, about um, who are in senior management positions in China right now about um, how reputation, recovery, development, enhancement is going to rest on some of their actions that they take, uh, sort of moving forward? What advice are you giving to um, uh, businesses in China? Um, I think I, uh, I would like to give uh, a few um, advice to them. One of the most important advice is at the time of uh, national difficulty, they should uh, partner with government and uh, they should uh, um, work together with government. Taking the urgent hospital uh, this time as one example is a good result of collaboration of many parties. Uh, the government, the hospitals in Wuhan, and uh, national uh, companies, state-owned companies, and private businesses, they work together. And there are management people on site, and not only the workers, employees, the very high management people, vice deputy, uh, CEO, they work there, they lead, and they show people. So that's why one big hospital can be set up within 10 days. So that's one of the advice I would like to give to them. Other advice is they have to show people they are care for their employees first because uh, uh, they can't force their employees to, to work at the time of uh, a pandemic. So they, they, they try to find a solution, how to keep working uh, from home or um, protective measures uh, guarantee that. And, and also in terms of communication, we have many channels in China. We have uh, uh, Weibo, we have company, um, Douyin especially right now. So they have different channels to uh, let the information out. So I, I think uh, um, they, they have to do, tell people by doing, tell people by doing. But of course, tell people by uh, giving transparent information. So I think China this time, and not only companies, but governments, they are doing very well in news press conference. They give so many press conference to people, so let people follow their news. So basically, I want to um, tell mm. them by doing and setting good example and give transparent information. Thank you. Um, uh, Hori-san, we have a question uh, for you that's popped up from the audience. So the, the Japanese government has been working on workforce reform over the last couple of, a couple of years. Do you see uh, the work ethic, culture, attitudes changing as a result of the pandemic in Japan? I think we should take this pandemic as one of the opportunities to transform the, the way we do businesses and the way we work. I say four transformations happening. 
And that will answer the question. One is that the transformation is digital transformation. You know, um, in case of Globis, we used to have businesses you know, like education offline, but everybody is now learning online. So digital transformation is changing the way we do businesses. Second transformation is remote work transformation. We mentioned about workforce, you know, everybody has to stay at home. And therefore, we have to go through all the telework using Zoom. And we use chat work. And then every, you know, we, in Japan, we have hankos still. And then we abolishing it, and we abolishing paper. So workforce transformation, remote work transformation is what is happening. Third transformation is stay clean. You know, like, like a hygiene transformation is going on. So everywhere you go, like restaurant, anywhere, offices, you have to clean up, wash, 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 and it's good, great. And fourth transformation is energy saving transformation. We saw the fuel price going negative, and we can see the energy savings going on. So with those transformation, what is actually happening is that, you know, in case of Globus, let me give you an example of Globus. Not all the faculty want to teach online. They didn't like it. Not all the students want to learn online. They prefer a real class discussion. However, they are forced to be online, so they have no choices, but they transform themselves to be online. So that's happening also for all the employees. Not all of them want to, you know, want to do remote works, but they are forced to do it. So we can take this as opportunities. As Richard mentioned, at the same time, business model can be changed. Education yeah. was real class discussion. Now it's online. Gym, it was also in the gym, but now it's, we have online gym. Uh, restaurants, we are takeout and also delivery. We can change the business model. And this is a very good way to transform our workforce and the way we do businesses and we make, the way we make, make money. Mm, thank you. Um, Kishore, a question coming in uh, to you about um, uh, uh, the high level of trust in, in governments. And really it goes back to the first question I sort of asked you, which is, uh, which is how do governments avoid bursting the trust bubble? And, and, and the, 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 the second bit of the question is related to the level of financial support that government is now handing out. That doesn't seem sustainable. It's not sustainable in the long term. So how do the government sort of um, you know, transition from high level of trust in the sense they've been able to buy through quick actions now, finance coming down into into long-term um, efforts that are going to produce a more sort of stable and to go back to one of the things Richard talked about a more maybe sort of equitable society um, it is concerning that we're seeing inequities growing not declining in all of that um, how, how would you how do you advise governments and ministers in relation to the next phase of intervention well, I, uh, two parts. Uh, part one, I think it's important to understand that culture plays a role here. And in Asian culture, there's always been a kind of a traditional uh, deference to government and acceptance that government has an important role to play in, in society, a leadership role to play in society. By contrast, as you know, just to illustrate this point, uh, when Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were leading their countries, there was the Reagan-Thatcher revolution and Ronald Reagan very famously said, government is not the solution. Government is the problem. So the whole idea was planted in many Western minds that the way you strengthen a society is to dismantle government, make it weaker and weaker and weaker, let the markets decide everything and society be better off. And of course, now we're seeing the results of dismantling governments or even very credible uh, federal agencies, whether it's uh, FDA, FAA, are struggling now because they have been demoralized, delegitimized in the process. So that delegitimization of government process has not taken place in Asia. And so that gives Asia in some ways, I would say, a competitive strength. But at the same time, I think the second point I'm going to make is that the Asian government should not underestimate the challenge that COVID-19 is uh, ch producing for them. And while in the short run, you can do this pump priming, give money away, mm. and if you're in like Singapore, you can do a lot of it. But you know, many Asian governments can't do it. They don't have the money, frankly, you know, whether it's even India or uh, Indonesia and so on and so forth. So the, 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 these governments, unfortunately, have to think very hard 
about how they jumpstart their economies again in a very different global environment. And here, the only piece of good news is that whereas the United States, as you know, has been walking away from free trade agreements, walking away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, the East Asian countries haven't done so, and they're proceeding with their free trade arrangements. So, for example, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, Singapore is pushing for it to be done by the uh, end of this year. So, if we continue to expand our trade, if we continue to grow in that way, then I think that will be a cushion uh, that will help East Asia manage what will be, frankly, a very difficult transition to a post-COVID-19 world. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, maybe a, a couple of very final questions, uh, Professor Fan, to you in sort of China. You know, is this a moment when um, China starts to take more of a leadership role on the world stage as it begins to provide aid um, to other company, countries around the world? How do you, what do you make of um, sort of the next steps in, um, um, in, in China's position in the world? Is this a moment um, when, it, when, it, when it exerts more influence or you don't see it moving in that direction? Uh, I, I think um, um, I, I'm not sure whether uh, this is a, um, a moment or not, but I, I, I think that within China, uh, the government uh, is a policy of the government to uh, encourage shared human destiny like a shared future, future for all countries together. So China over the past decade, I think after Xi Jinping, so take more active role in the global uh, stage. Uh, I, I, and I myself, I see the change. I see China is influential sometimes uh, on some, some situation, but uh, um, it's quite sad sometimes. Anything uh, connected with China and uh, people don't want to trust, they refuse to trust. So I, I think it's fairly sad uh, to me. I trust China. I trust as long as any government can do good for its people and can do good for the world. Why, why not trust? So I hope every country supports any country can take the need in helping people to live a better life. Not only its country people, but people whenever they need. So I, I appreciate my country, China, uh, uh, to do good uh, in many ways. So, um, I think uh, if the, a country can be supported, um, of course, can be more on the global stage. Yeah, well, that's a, and it's a, it's a great place to sort of, you know, sort of leave things really, which is sort of advice to leaders, um, behavior change they wanted, and, and this promotion of trust, of course, is what we're, all, all of us at Edelman are sort of trying to promote with the, uh, with the trust barometer and drive all of that. And I wonder, um, Richard, that sounds like a good moment to hand back to you, maybe just to reflect on some of the, um, uh, some of the comments, observations you've heard uh, about trust uh, more generally, and um, and I'll leave it for you to sort of sum up uh, wh what you've taken away from this discussion. Well, I actually want to go back to uh, Kishore's uh, major point in the beginning, which is, you know, is this a uh, sea change in uh, global governance? And I, I've heard him speak before about you know the shift to Asia. And uh, his point about transfer of competence to government uh, is interesting. Um, I will tell you that the biggest jumps um, in, in our numbers vis-a-vis uh, -vis government were actually uh, in the UK, um, which surprised us since Boris was one of the victims of, of COVID initially, and he was a doubter and wanted to have herd uh, immunity, that sort of novel uh, scientific approach. But um, the fact is that I think the West is still in the mode of Reagan, Thatcher, and deregulation and, you know, relatively benign government. And I think that's the real question. You know, are we going to get used to big government in the West in the same way that maybe it's been so in Asia? You know, that China has certainly has strong government, India has very strong government. Um, Japan is less interventionist, but still strong government. Uh, and that's an open question. I think one of the really outstanding issues is how will companies compete when there's such a desire for nationalism? 60% of the respondents in our study said, if you're a multinational company and you make products, you have to favor your home market. Bring those N95 masks to the US. We need them more than those Asian people. You know, 
I don't know how you have a multinational if you can't actually supply products globally, you know, and it has to be local favoritism. So I can only tell you that um, the circus in the U.S. will get to be more circus-like in the next six months. Um, the campaign between Biden and Trump will be carried out on Twitter more than in campaign rallies. It's going to be certainly unusual. Um, I think that all countries in the world are going to have to kind of hold their heads while they watch this uh, circus play out. Um, but it belies an underlying kind of um, concern about downward economic mobility. And I think at the core, it's all to do with me and my income, and I'm scared. And if we can deal with fears, then we can actually do something important. And that's why I hope all the people on this call appreciate the importance of communication in dealing with fear. Corey San said it very correctly. If we can't communicate, we can't win. We mm -hmm. have to persuade our CEOs to speak up. I know it's not an Asian thing. I know it's, let's just talk to local media. Let's do it once a year. It's kind of like going to the dentist. Um, it doesn't work. We have to talk all the time because there's so much false information. A lie gets around the world before the truth gets out of bed in the morning. And so we have got to talk more. We've got to make the case for trade. We have to make the case for business. And we have to make the case that business is for good, not just government is for good. It's important. As usual, in, with the Edelman Cross Barometer, there's so much data that sits behind the slides that Richard presented today. And so we can look at different cuts from a sector perspective as well on a national thing as well. So all it remains me to say is thank you to um, uh, Hori San, to Professor Fan from China, and to Kishore Mababani. Thank you for your time today. Uh, really great debate, fascinating. Richard, good night, sleep well, and have a good day to the rest of you. Take care, bye-bye.